All right, man, and I'm, I'm glad to see y'all here today. Uh, it's good to have my oldest son and his wife visiting with us today down from Asheville, and uh, always glad to see see her. Um, no, glad to see both of them, glad to see both of them. All right, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, if you would, Romans 8, Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Romans 8, what a great chapter. There's some great, great verses in it. Let me turn this on. Some great verses in it. Um, look at the very first verse, Romans chapter 8. Boy, now this is a good one right here. There is therefore now. What's the next two words? Okay, hey, let's, let's do that again. Let's do that again. I want, you to, I want you to let it sink in and get a hold of this. All right, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit now now, now look up in here for just a second did, did you just catch what that verse said okay I'm glad who said amen was that brother Barry or brother Rouse brother Rouse okay brother Rouse I knew it would be brother Barry there is therefore now what's those next two words no condemnation. Now, here's what condemnation is. When you go to court, you've broken the law, and uh, uh, there's a, um, uh, they're telling you, here's what you say you're guilty of, but at the end when the judge slams that little gavel down and he sentences you, you've been found guilty of, of whatever, you're sentenced to this many years in prison or you're sentenced to uh, death by electric chair or lethal injection or whatever, you are at that point a condemned man. Are you following me? Oh man, this is bad. This is bad. Are you following me? Okay. <clears throat> the moment that judge says you are guilty, here is the price you have to pay. By the way, the judge is the only one that can... Hey, Rachel, you sit down here. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm so... I'm just teasing. When that, man, I'm so stupid sometimes. Now, check this out. When that judge, he slams that hammer down. By the way, he's the only one that can condemn you, is the judge. Others can make accusations against you. Others can testify against you. But only that judge can condemn you. When he slams that little gavel down and he says, you are guilty, here's the price you have to pay, you are then a condemned man. Now look what that verse says again. Verse number one, there is therefore now no condemnation to who? Those of us that are in Christ Jesus now, if I've placed Jesus Christ, or my faith in Jesus Christ, all right, and I have accepted Him as my Savior, I hold Him as my only hope of eternity with God and reconciliation with God. My faith is in Christ and Christ alone. Now, listen, at this point, at the moment I do that, Brother Phil, there is now no condemnation. If you've ever heard Brother Phil's testimony, man, he was in a bad way. Before he trusted Christ all that stuff you've ever done brother Phil it's been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ it, man is, is that not good folks hey look, let me tell you something now I never I never did drugs or drank alcohol or any of that stuff I, it just never appealed to me I, I'm I act stupid enough without the help of some kind of other stuff so I didn't want to do any of that <clears throat> hey, who said that's right come on. Yeah, you better not raise your hand. We're rolling the grass. <laughs> now listen to this. I never did any of that stuff. But if I died without Jesus Christ as my Savior, I would have gone to the same hell as anybody else. So I was a sinner. A rebel against God. I didn't look at it that way, but that's what I was in God's sight. Anything good I had done was as filthy rags on my way to hell. If I died before I trusted Christ as my Savior, 
I would have one day been cast into an eternal lake of fire with no hope of ever getting out. That's condemnation. But now, when I was a 13-year-old young man, I realized my need for salvation. And the best I knew how, I called on the Lord Jesus Christ, asking Him to save my soul. I placed my faith in Christ and Him alone. Didn't place my faith in going to church. Didn't place my faith in being good. Didn't place my faith in in reading my Bible or, or, or praying before I ate, treating my neighbor good. I said, no, no, no. You, you know, you can do all that stuff and still go to hell if you've not placed your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. I placed my faith in Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. There is now no condemnation. I'm a new man in Jesus Christ. I'm no longer condemned. And so Paul starts out this letter, uh, Corinthians in chapter 8 here. He says, uh, uh, he says, hey, there's therefore now no condemnation. Now you read some of the rest of that chapter and you find out some other good things. You find out that Jesus Christ it constantly intercedes to God for us. You find uh, uh, that all things, everything in this life, the ups and the downs, it all works together for our good right to them that are in Christ Jesus am I, am I right church come on alright you find all these good things being said here in chapter 8 and then I want you to looky down at looky that's what Paul, Paul said looky down in verse 31 that's what it means that's what it says in the Greek there you go back in the Greek it's not look it's looky Romans 8 31 Dixie said sure do you know any Greek then you don't know See, I know Greek. I, listen to this. Listen to this. I know one thing in Greek. After taking a year of Greek, I know one thing. In Do you know what that means? In your face. That's the only thing I remember from Greek class. Now listen to this. Look in verse 31. What shall we say then to these things, Paul says? He says, all these good things, there's no more condemnation. Jesus Christ makes intercession for us. Everything that happens in our life, God will use it to work, it will all work together for our good. He says, what shall we say to these things? Oh, what do you think about these things? Now listen to what he follows it up with. If God be for us, who can be against us? Man, alive, that's a good verse. That's a great verse. If God be for us, who can be against us? Listen, I remember in high school playing sports and uh, I always loved, I, I, I loved it when the crowd got involved, when there was some cheering going on. We have some athletes, some basketball athletes, we got some baseball back there. Do, do y'all love it when the crowd gets in it? Do you love it when the crowd gets Hey, look, we got to do something because last night that crowd was dead. I, I was, man, I, I was ready to medicate somebody to get them, get, them, get them stirred up. But I loved it when the crowd gets in it. And I remember playing basketball and, man, I'd make a shot and my mom would say, good job, Bubby, or something. And I was like, oh, don't call me Bubby. Just say good job. And uh, my, my, my wife, maybe she was my girlfriend then, she'd be cheering on sidelines and the, the cheerleaders are cheering and, wow, Ronnie finally made a shot. And, uh, but, man, it, 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 it gets you going to know that somebody is for you. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I've had some times when it wasn't that way. Uh, there's been some times where I was a referee. There's been some times when I was an umpire. Anybody here ever done anything as a referee or an umpire? Okay. You know those games where nobody is for you? Now, even when you do well, that's a tough job because no matter what call you make, half that gym is going to hate your guts. It can be a great call. But the other team is mad at you for making it. Man, that was a great call, but we hate you for making that. But there are those games where for whatever reason there's tension between the two teams and you can do no right and everybody is against you. It's not a good place to be. The worst is in Little League sports. Little League sports is the worst, man. It, hey, all Christian ethics go out the window 
if you're a parent in little league sports for most people. I remember playing little league baseball, and I remember the parents just, they were all over the umpire behind the plate. It got so bad, one of the parents ran up to the fence and chunked their Coca-Cola through the fence onto him. He said, ball game. He started walking off the field. Man, this one sweet lady took her cigarette out and went up and put it out on his arm. That's not a good place to be, folks. When not, uh, everybody's against you, and it feels like nobody's for you. Have you ever been there? Where you know, well, I, I know these people love me and all, but right now, in what I'm doing, where I'm at, I, I, I just don't feel like anybody is for me. Have you felt like, well, ever been there where you felt like no one was for you, but everyone was against you? Uh, one of my favorite stories about a martyr is about a man named Athanasius, who, who during the Roman Empire, he stood before, I guess it was the emperor, and as he was being tried for being a Christian, they were trying to get him to recant his faith. And they said, Athanasius, do you not realize the whole world is against you? And this elderly man said, if the whole world is against Athanasius, then Athanasius is against the whole world. Man, what, what backbone, what faith. Have you ever been there where there was plenty of accusers but no defenders? Plenty of judges but no advocates? Plenty of casting judgment but no displaying mercy? An abundance of piling on opinions but no one to help bear the burden? Many people wanting the inside scoop but nobody just wanting to know you. No champion to represent you. No supporter to hold you up. No backer to strengthen you. No spokesman to intercede for you. No campaigner to, to promote you. No crusader willing to fight on your behalf. You ever been there? You know, it's amazing sometimes in those situations, you think, and it's very true, if I just had one person that was for me, if I just had one person that was for me, sometimes when I get to having a little pity party, I, I, I think of my wife and how my wife, it, no matter what it seems like, is for me. As long as I know that that one person is for me, I feel like I could charge hell with water pistols and, and, and win the fight. Everybody else could be against me. Everybody else could say, oh, Pastor Wise, he's a, a what a numbskull, what a knucklehead. Boy, he, he just doesn't have a clue what he's doing. And, and, but as long as my wife is back there saying, hey, you got me. I'm for you. Man, that does a lot. Little Landon Schroeder came up to me a few weeks ago, Sunday morning after a service. And, and, and man, I, it's amazing what a nine-year-old kid can do for you sometimes. And he said, Pastor Wise, I need you to promise me something. What is it? He said, I need you to promise. Pastor Wise, you've got to promise that you will not quit preaching. As long as I'm here, you won't quit preaching. Will you promise me? Yeah. Ryan back there told me one week I said I'll see you later he said no 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 you're going to be brave no matter how big a chicken you are you know what in that moment I was like I am going to be brave you don't know how many times I've thought of that and his voice I think back and no Ryan no matter how big a chicken I am. Just knowing you had one person for you. The Word of God 
is replete with stories about that. In Romans 8, 31, once again, he says, what shall we say to these things? Paul did. He said, look, there's, there's no more condemnation. If I'm in Christ Jesus, I am forgiven. I am reconciled with God. I am one of his children. He loves me. Now, unconditionally, he says, what shall we say to these things? God be for us. He's, he's, here's what I'll tell you. If God's for us, then who in the world can be against us? He's saying, what does it matter? What does it matter if they're all against us, if God is for us? What does that mean to be for us? Here's what it means. It means to be on one's side, to favor or to further one's cause. We see it in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17, where he said that the, the Lord said this to the children of Israel, Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, uh, set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be afraid. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. The Lord told Jehoshaphat that he would fight the battle for them. He said, you're not going to need to fight this battle. I'll fight it for you. Now, here's the thing. What he, he didn't just mean... I'm going to fight it so you don't have to. He said, you don't need to fight because I'm fighting on your behalf. I'm fighting in your favor. He's saying, Israel, I am for you. I will be your champion. I will be your advocate. I will be your support. I will be your strength. I will be your protector, Israel. I'm fighting on your behalf. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 through 14, the Bible says this, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, and see the sal stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will uh, show, you, show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen, today ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Israel had just left Egypt. Now Pharaoh's army is chasing them, wanting to bring them back into servitude. They're trapped between the uh, Egyptian army and the Red Sea. And God said, listen, Israel, look, calm down, just stand still. Just stand still and watch and see my salvation. I am going to fight for you. He didn't just mean that he would fight so they wouldn't have to. It meant that he would stand in favor of them. He said, Israel, look, there's a great conflict going on here, and I want you to know that I am on your side. I am standing in favor of you. Here they are, they're trapped between the sea and the mighty Egyptian army, most powerful army in the world at that time. Here they are, they're slaves that have just left Egypt. Now they're about to be captured or killed. And God said, or, 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 don't you know the panic that had to be there? Now what are we going to do? There's the ocean here, or the sea here. Maybe we can try to swim across it. We'll, we'll see who can get across alive. Or we can just uh, submit to them and hope they don't kill us. What are we going to do? They even began to say to Moses, Moses, you just brought us out here to die in the desert, didn't you? And God said, listen, Israel, calm down, stand still, watch. Watch what I do here. Watch my salvation. I am going to fight on your behalf. Israel, I'm on your side. Psalm chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, listen to what David said. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? saying, Lord, there's so many people against me. Some are trying to kill me. Some are trying to capture me. Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. So we're out to get him, and God can't even help him. What a lonely place. Verse 3, but thou... O oh Lord, art a shield for me. Once again, that meaning there, on my behalf, in my favor. 
my glory and the lifter up of my head. Listen, this morning, or, or two weeks ago, we talked about Christ in us. We've been given this incredible mission of, of spreading the gospel to the world. How are we going to do that? Because Christ is working in us. As a follower of Christ, I, I'm striving to yield so that Christ can live that life in me. How in the world, uh, you know, I'm just sinful flesh. And how in the world are, am I going to be able to live this Christ life because Christ is in us? I'm crucified in Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth what? In me, he said. Last week we talked about Christ with me. No matter where I am, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou, 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 I just lost it. Yeah, thou art with me. There we go. You're with me no matter where I am. In the best of times, in the worst of times, Christ is right there with me. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. This week I want to look at Christ. Not only is he in me, not only is he with me, but he's for me. Do you understand what I mean by that? He is in my favor. He's behind me. He wants me to fulfill his will. He wants me to live in his blessings. He wants me. He's on my side as well as me being on his side. Listen, I'll tell you how much so. In Romans 5, 8, he says this, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died what? For us. It, it's more than just the idea of he died so that I don't have to. It's he died on my behalf. He died for me. He, was, he died because he's on my side. He died because he's in favor of Ronnie Wise. He wants Ronnie Wise to spend an eternity with him. He's for me. So Christ died for me. Do you understand what I'm saying? He died in my place, but also he died because he favored me. Now listen, there was nothing here to favor. Paul said, he said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Paul himself, the one that the Lord used to write much of the New Testament, said, I, 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 of sinners, of, of whom I am chief. He said, I'm the worst of sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ favored us. Christ on our behalf, out of love for us, rooting for us, cheering for us. He also died for us. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was, not, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. He was so much for me that he took my shame on his own self on that cross. He took my sin on his own self. He took my condemnation on his own self. And on that cross he suffered for my sin so that I wouldn't have to. All I had to do was place my faith in Jesus Christ and him alone because he was for me. Now listen, that by the way is the only way to have a relationship with God. That's the first step. It's got to be through Jesus Christ. That is the only way to spend an eternity in heaven reconciled with God. It's through Jesus Christ. There has to be a time in our life where we realize, man, I can't do this on my own. I can't be good enough to get to heaven. Man, I'm a sinner. At that time with all our heart, we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, asking him to save our soul and just trusting him, placing our faith in him to do so. That's salvation. That's the very first step right there of being reconciled or, or of having a relationship with God is to be saved, to trust Him as Savior. Now, you can come to church every time the doors are open. You could be baptized to your water log. It won't get you to heaven. It's got to be a time where you place your faith in Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. He's for us, okay? He 
things for us, just like those spectators on the sideline when they're cheering for the team. Went and watched, some of us went and watched UMO play last night. Man, that qu- crowd, I don't understand. I, I don't go to a, a basketball game to relax too much. I, I like it to be rowdy, especially when there's a lot of people. I was telling my wife, can we do something to get this crowd going? Finally, some guy on the other side, when uh, this is during the guys' game, and the guys were, were trailing, and uh, this guy, on, when they were on defense, he started stomping, boom, boom, defense, boom, boom, defense. I said, yeah, great. So we joined in, and 15 seconds later, that knucklehead stopped. There was about five of us on this side. Defense. What in the world? Like, man, let's, let's let them know we're, we're for them, just like those fans on the sideline are for their team. Christ is for us. He died for us. Listen to this. He intercedes for us. Hebrews 7, 25, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He stands between a holy God and sinful man, And when sinful man comes to Jesus Christ, he says, Father, they're placing their faith in in, in me. I took my sins on them. And now look, I'm putting my righteousness on them. I've paid for it in full. It is finished. He approached a holy God because we were not able to. Why would he do that? Because he's for you. Do, Do you get what I'm saying, church? At least do this to me right here. Okay? Just you can't at least just raise one eyebrow or you know. He stood between God and, and, and us on our behalf to make us righteous. Listen, there's nothing righteous about us. He took our sin so that we could be made righteous. Why? Because he is for us. Second Corinthians 5:21 tells us just as much where it says this, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Talk about God, Christ. He didn't even know sin. Why did he do that? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. My goodness. Brother Brother Barry's a friend here. I I love Brother Barry. Our youth pastor. I'm not coming at you with a joke. Let's say Brother Barry just went off the deep end. He went out and tried to rob a bank, armed robbery. He shot at a few officers or whatever. Finally, they apprehended him. They took him to court. He goes to trial. And they said, look, armed robbery. He shot at officers, a, a, attempted murder, whatever. They throw the book at him. He said, Chris Barry, you've been found guilty of the crimes you're accused of. You're sentenced to 40 years in prison. I love Brother Barry. But there ain't no way I'd say, Judge, tell you what, I'll take his 40 years for him. No, I'm going to send you letters and I'll come visit you and say, wow, you look nice and orange. Okay. But Christ was so much for us that he took our sin upon his own self in order to place his righteousness on us. He interceded for us. Not only did he intercede for us, but look in Hebrews 9, 4, or you don't have to look there, you can just write it down and look later. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Once again, for us. On our behalf. He is for us. He's not against Sometimes we get the idea that God is some old man sitting up on the throne with a lightning bolt in his hand and he's just looking for a reason to fries. He's not against us. He's for us. Uh, by the way, he was for me enough when I was lost that he would die for me so that I could be reconciled with him. He advocates for us. 
1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So you know what an advocate is? It's one who is called to one's side. Called to one's aid. One who pleads the cause of another. The Bible calls the devil the accuser of the brethren, constantly accusing us before God. Well, I know I, keep, I give him plenty of reasons, I'm sure. God, you see what Ronnie just did right down there? Do you see that sin? Do you see that thought he harbored? Do you see what he was doing? Do you see what he was looking at? Did you, did you hear what he said? Did you see that attitude? God, do you see all these sins? Do you see how he, he, he's neglecting to do some of the things you'd have him do? What a rotten sinner. And here Jesus comes to stand to my aid. He says, Father, I was on February 3rd, 1983. Placed his faith in me. His sins have all been paid for. He, everything's being said about him is true. He has done all these things, and they've all been paid for with my blood. He's accepted the payment. And God says, innocent of all charges, justified, purified, forgiven. How is it, how can me, Ronnie Wise, how can any of us who are sinners stand before a holy God? Here's how. Because Christ, the Holy Son of God, is not against us. He is for us. What shall we say then to these things, Paul said? If Christ be for us, who can be against us? What does that mean? What does that mean to us? Let me tell you something. Sometimes we get to saying, man, all of life is against me. You ever felt that way? All of life is against me. Everywhere I turn, everything's just falling apart. My whole life is falling down around me. It seems like everywhere I go, everything is against me. Nothing goes right. Now listen, if God, can be, if God be for us, who can be against us? Life itself can't be against us. Romans 8, 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Listen, God will not withhold anything that I need in this life. He is for us. Life can't even be against me. No charges will ever be brought against me in God's court. Listen to Romans 8, 33, Who shall lay anything to the... Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Paul said, uh, uh, if God's for us, who can be against us? Paul said in Romans 8, 32, life can't even be against us. He says in Romans 8, 33, uh, uh, that no charges will be brought against us. Though we are accused, the accusations are false because God has declared us righteous. No one can condemn us. Remember, I said that earlier. Only the judge is able to condemn, but the judge has already declared me justified. Romans 8, 34, who is he that condemneth? Who's it? Hey, look, the devil accuses, people accuse. And Paul said, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And there have been times in this life where I felt like I was under the condemnation of man and there was no way I could please man no matter what I did. There were time, have been times in this life where I felt like, whether it was true or not, I felt like everybody is against me. Have you ever been there or am I the only one? There were times where I felt like man was condemning me. Man, they were accusing me. They were on my case. But listen, none of that really matters. Because Christ is for me. Nothing, because he's for me, nothing can separate me from this love. Absolutely nothing. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Paul goes on. 
actual tribulation or distress or, per, or persecution or famine or nakedness or, or peril or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now listen to what Paul says. He says, shall any of these things separate us from God? Nay, that means no. <clears throat> Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, listen to what Paul says, he says, I know, I am so convinced that Christ is on my side. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing! Nothing! He says, life can't be against me. The accusations of people can't be against me. The accusations of the Satan can't be against me. There's no more condemnation. God is on my side. He is for me. So let me tell you, you, you ever see these t-shirts that say, no fear? You ever see those bumpers there? No fear. Well, if that's true for anybody, it ought to be true for the Christian. No fear. Why? Because God is for me. Sometimes we get paralyzed by fear of failure. No need to be afraid of failure. Not if God's for us, because all things are going to work together for our good, even the failure. I don't have to be afraid of circumstances. I don't have to be afraid of people's accusations. I don't have to be afraid of what people think. I don't have to, to be afraid of condemnation. I don't have to be afraid of any of those things. I don't have to be anxious about them. I don't have to worry about them. God is for me. As a parent, how many parents in here ever experience worry? It's pretty natural, isn't it? But I don't have to be ruled by it. I got these five sons whom I love more than life. It was my desire for them to live for God. But when it all boils down, they have become or are becoming their own men who have to make their choices. And whatever choice they make, Jesus Christ is still for them. So are you saying you don't worry about your kids? No, all the time. I'm just saying I don't have to be ruled by that. I don't have to live in fear of that. Because Jesus Christ is for me. Persecution cannot separate me from him. Distress cannot separate, him from, separate me from him. Famine, nakedness, peril, sword, life, death, angels, principalities, powers, there is nothing, nothing, nothing that will ever cause God to turn from one of his children. Nothing. Christ is for me. I wonder what kind of change, oh, listen, hey, this is some good notes, let's read these. I don't have to be afraid of my circumstances. Do I have that written down? Wow, I do. Let me read over here. That's some good notes. I don't have to be afraid of my circumstances. God's for me. By the way, he said, I'm a, more than a conqueror in that. I don't have to be afraid of what someone else thinks of me. God's for me. I'm a conqueror, man. I don't have to be afraid of God not accepting me. He's already said he's for me. Listen to what a man named Peter Treff said. He, talking about Jesus Christ. He's what we really need. If your friend is sick and dying, the most important thing he wants is not an explanation, but for you to sit with him. He's terrified of being alone more than anything else. So God has not left us alone. I read a story this week, and I'll close. Let me tell you this story. The young man, he said he was, I think he was either 
middle school or maybe a freshman in high school. Walking home from school one day, it's supposed to be a true story, he's walking home from school one day and saw another kid walking who, who was, he realized was a new kid at their school, had just transferred to their school, and he's walking home carrying every one of his books. Oh, who in the world would carry all of their books home? He said, he must be a real nerd. Some other kids from the school ran up to him and pushed him, knocked his books all out of his hand, and they just laughed, made fun of him, and they ran off. And this guy here walked over to him and helped pick up the books and said, man, look, don't let them guys get to you. They're jerks. They need to get a life. And he helped pick them up and found out the boy lived right down the road from him. He helped carry those books. He walked the boy home. They became great friends. The guy who helped him became a football star. People looking at him to go play football at college. This young man, he went on to become very successful in school, became a, a fairly popular kind of guy. Very well studied, ended up valedictorian of his class. And he stood up and he said there at his valedictorian address, he said, you know, this is a time these commencement exercises we get up and we... We thank everybody who helped us get this far, our parents, our teachers, our coaches. He said, but even more so probably are those, those real dear friends who were there for us when we felt like no one else was. And he said, when I first came to this school, I was walking home one day with all of my books in my hand. I cleaned out my locker so that my mom wouldn't have to come and clean it out after I committed suicide. I was going to go home that weekend, and I was going to take my own life. And I was carrying those books home. Some guys ran up. They knocked the books out of my hand. And another young fella saw it. He came up to me, and he helped pick those books up. He helped me carry those books home. We became great friends, and I decided not to take my life because I had somebody that was there for me. Listen, I want to tell you something. There are, there are some people in our church that are carrying some really heavy loads. There's going to be times where you feel like, man, life itself is against me. I don't even know if God's for me at this time. No, listen, let me tell you something. You may feel like nobody else is for you, but I promise you, I guarantee you, Jesus Christ is for you. Wonder how it would change our whole way of living if we didn't just acknowledge that truth, but we embraced that truth. And during those times where we felt like it's all crumbling down around us and everything is against us, we just realized and lived in light of the fact that though everything else is against me, Jesus Christ is for me. And if Jesus Christ is for me, what does it matter if everything else is against me? Jesus Christ in us. The believer, Jesus Christ in us. Jesus Christ with us. Jesus Christ is for us. Let me ask this question. Do you personally know Jesus Christ? Has there been a time when you realize, man, I'm in hell. I'm on my way to hell. I need a Savior at that time place your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone to save your soul He calls Himself the door you place your faith in Jesus Christ that opens up a whole new life of hope, joy and purpose has there ever been a time you've done that you say yeah I've done that preacher I'm saved alright then are you living in that fact that Jesus Christ is for you bow your head and close your eyes please